And we are live. Welcome and happy Monday. Today I am wearing a nice polo t-shirt, okay? I'm keeping it classy and um, it's a special day today. And I just found this out, if you don't know this, that today, July 26th on a Wednesday is actually the first day of a new year. And I didn't know that. I thought that January 1st, my entire life was the first day of the new year. And this is from uh, a website that says, in today's world, we are generally dominated by the Gregorian calendar, which was inherited from the Romans, hashtag thank you Romans, and was used by the Romans to calculate when taxes were due to be collected and ran from January 1st each year. So obviously easy to account for money and that sort of thing if it starts on Jan 1. But according to the Mayan calendar, uh, the year runs from the 26th of July each year and is calculated using a series of 17 cycles which are linked to the movements of the sun, moon, planets, and even constellations like the Pleiades. So if we've got one Gregorian calendar that is set up to rotate around tax collection and then we have another calendar that's more set up in a mere response to what's happening actually in our world like a true man that sounds way more cool to me and luckily i do not have to uh, show up to a nine to five job i get to work for myself so happy new year everybody if you did not know this is the new year and i, I guess there are a bunch of cultures that also um, have shared very similar calendars in the Mayans before the Gregorian calendar became the dominant calendar across the world and the Romans and then the taxpayers and the Catholics and all that kind of stuff. So just a little bit of a different perspective. Happy New Year, which is why I'm wearing a nice polo t-shirt because I'm trying to kick off this new year, you know, real prof professional, like I'm trying to step my game up as all of us are really trying to do. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about earning your environment, the environments that you love to play, exercise, compete in. We're going to be talking about earning those environments and also taking responsibility for those. Because as we are now in this modern world where we have sports, we have martial arts, we have triathlons, Ironman, pickleball, we've got so many things that we can do with our bodies because our bodies and our physical effort is not mandated to taking care of the garden or harvesting crops or creating things or hunting in the wild. We have so much free energy with our physical bodies and we can disperse it in any place that we really feel called to, but that brings up some difficulties sometimes and it's a little bit confusing for us. My friend Lex, who is currently in the Primal Movement Coaches Certification right now, reached out to me with a voice note that I'm going to play for everybody because it really sets the stage on the topic that I'm excited to share with everyone, which is owning your environment. So let's listen to Lex. Yo, bam. How you doing, brother? I went to jiu-jitsu last night for the first time since doing the recoding. It's such a damn red light sometimes, like got injured. Um, maybe it was due to the new space in like my lower back or just pause real quick. He said, it's such a red light. Red light is a term that we use for a negative or unpleasant feeling within the body. This could be a little pinch. This could be a spasm or something that is getting cranked on. So he went to jujitsu and felt some red lights and it's disappointing. Well, you know, my hips, but essentially where I'm prone to get hurt is on my, like, it's my left side and my lower back but it's like kind of at the pelvis level and it kind of adds pain to like the left ql nothing crazy like i'm walking around i'm cruising it's just there it's like a vulnerability and it's just kind of yeah it gets aggravated it's pretty common it can pop up unless i'm training jujitsu a lot then it kind of like gets conditioned do you have an idea on what that might be or have any tips or anything to look at to um help myself identify this because i just not quite not quite getting it but that's the only ever form of pain that I've really like come across. It's a little bit limiting. And what's your thoughts? How you, how's your view on grappling? Now with such a huge appreciation for your body and just wanting to stay, you know, moving, moving well. Let me know. 
I, I just want to, you know, you want to train so bad. It's such an enjoyable thing. But not when you put heaps of time into your body and then you go there and you just like come out with full of red lights and you're like, man, um, I'm sure this is something you've dealt with. And I'm sure like anyone who is like prioritizing, you know, really good human movement and wanting to be pain free and looking after their body, like jujitsu is obviously renowned for just busting people up. But I don't think it has to be that way, but it just is being that way at the moment. And maybe it just is. Maybe it's just the positions that you're in and maybe it's not as natural as we think. Or is it? I'd love to hear your take on it, mate. And if you're still practicing um, since you've been you know, into like biomechanics and human movement, I'd love to hear it. Number one, um, this this little voice note um, is one of the reasons that I started coaching, training, um, and practicing a practice outside of my movement practice of jiu-jitsu. So I started training jiu-jitsu at 15, fell in love with it, obviously, and quickly ran into some problems with my shoulders. I tore, tore both labrums in my shoulders um, had bulging discs in my neck, low back pain, those types of common injuries that we see in jujitsu. I, I quickly started to um, manifest within my own body at age 16, 17, and then 18. And I intuitively started to create ways, practices that would support my practice of jujitsu so that I would have a little bit more resiliency on the mats. And then after I got off the mats that I had a way to kind of put the pieces back together, so to speak. I started doing that for my own body and then all of my friends started getting hurt more and they weren't able to do jujitsu. And I loved the jujitsu community and it makes me so sad when someone has to sit on the side of the mat and just like take notes like they're in a timeout corner or they don't show up to the gym at all and it's really difficult for their emotions and their mind because jujitsu is such a big part of their life in for many people sport hobbies or physical recreation takes a part of our identity it takes a part of our soul and we put so much energy into that that if that time our relationship with that hobby gets cut short because of a physical injury, because of, you know, you have to move or finances or, or for whatever reason you get pulled from that before you actually decided to move on to something else, it could be really challenging for our psychological, emotional bodies. And I, I watched that happen and I wanted to affect some change with within my community of jujitsu practitioners. So that's why I started actually down this road of coaching movement, strength and conditioning, because the traditional ways that people were approaching taking care of their bodies or rehabbing to stay on the mats was not working. And just to clarify back on Lex, Lex is experiencing, he just went back to jujitsu after spending a significant time uh, recoding and working on his movement and up leveling his body. And then his left lower QL just tightened up and it's frustrating for him. Now, number one, if you have ever had lower left QL problems or tightness, you know how common this is. PRI and there are a bunch of other really great practitioners who talk about the normal twists that happen at our hip level that can cause these imbalances that make it uh, these problem areas prone to come up again and again and again in people that sit, people that do jujitsu, whatever. So we've got a lot of physiological, anatomical reasons why somebody's lower left QL can get pissed off at them. And myself have experienced this a lot. When I get out of bad shape or I get compressed in my body, my lower left QL really holds on for dear life. And I, and I use that QL to hold a lot of my structure. And as a result, I'll have a huge shark fin on my left side and my right lower back will be chilling, but I'll have a huge crossfitter um, shark fin on my left side. Now, a lot of that is also because of the constants of jujitsu, the right to left people that are always attacking your left side. You're always turning to the right. You're always in the same staggered stance position, usually left foot forward, right foot back or vice versa. But there's a lot of one sided or one angle dominance in jujitsu and one angle um, offenses that we take when somebody's trying to manipulate us that create patterns to show themselves up. So 
before we talk about that, I want to bring us back a little bit more into just the the state uh, that we are in, uh, the situation that we are in as humans right now. Like I said, we are not hunting. We are not having to harvest our food out in the wild. We don't have to walk for five miles a day on average, which is what our indigenous ancestors had to do. We don't rest and hang out on the ground. Our natural lifestyle and the natural movements that were part of a a lifestyle um, are now not a requirement. You can make the choice to sit in your couch all day. You can make the choice to have an office job and work out of an office chair for nine to five hours. There are so many choices that you can do with your body in terms of what it does in the positions that it hangs out most of the most of the day, majority of the day, whether it's like sitting, standing like a security job or driving if you're doing Uber or something like that. And then there are also an infinite amount of opportunities that you can do with your body that are now accessible to us because we have surpassed the responsibility and need for our bodies to do harvesting, um, sitting on the ground, working with stuff, hunting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can choose to go kite surf. You can choose to cliff jump. You can choose to do yoga all day, Pilates, dance. I mean, you know, think about the infinite amount of physical outlets that we have developed as we have surpassed the need to use our physical body to survive. Now it's our minds, our voices, and like a little bit of our fingers for texting, etc. So there's an infinite amount of things that you can do with your body. And generally, socially, we coin most of those things as healthy. So like, for instance, if someone says, oh yeah, you know, I started going to the gym again, I got back in the gym, I'm doing fitness, most people will say like, oh yeah, that's like a really healthy thing for you to do. Somebody says, yeah, I, start, I picked up jujitsu. I've been doing jujitsu for a year now. It's like been really cool. I've been developing. Most people will say like, that's awesome. I like that. Good, healthy choices. They'll have that kind of sense about this positive embarkment that you're going on. So many different things. Where if somebody set, told you, oh yeah, I've, I've uh, you know picked up a drinking habit. I really enjoy going to the bars three to four times a night and just kind of like drinking. People aren't going to receive that with the same uh, lens of health. They're going to say, okay, like that's something you're doing. I hope it's enjoyable to you and it's like safe. But nobody would say like this is a healthy thing for you to do. Um, if you said, hey, I'm staying up late watching Netflix on my phone and, you know, I just really enjoy, you know, 12, 1, 2 a.m. just staying up and binge watching TVs, people would also not say, yeah, that's like a healthy thing for you to do. So in general, what I'm trying to paint is this picture of we have a general consensus of what is healthy or positive for the body and what is unhealthy or negative for the body. This is a good discernment to have, but it doesn't paint the full picture to us, the actual practitioners, the actual people who are going out in the world and putting our bodies in the arena. What do I mean when I say that? Well, if we take the definition of health, And the purest, most superficial definition of health is um, the physical body being in a state without illness or injury. So when you are not sick and you are not injured, you are in a state of health. We can argue all day and night about the definition of health, but let's use that very superficial definition right now to determine if something is healthy or not healthy. Um, let's talk about running. If someone said, hey, I I wake up every day and I run, you might be like, man, that dude is like a healthy guy. He like gets up and he goes run. But then if we look at the statistics, most runners, 70% of them will have some kind of injury. So running will create a state of non-health. They will have an injury, which means they will be outside of health. So running, which we will coin as healthy, could eventually lead to you being in a state of outside of your health. Bear with me right now for this mental thing. Try not to grab onto anything too much. Hold on. So 70% of runners 
will experience some kind of injury within their body. So if you had a statistics of science or, or research and you said you do one thing, like you, you make one action and there's a 70% chance that if you repeat that action that you're going to hurt your physical body. By definition, by objective definition, 70%, we would say that's 30% could be contributing to your health. 70% could be contributing to a state of unhealth or non-health. Um, so that's just running. Running is a very common one. Let's pick up another very common one, um, exercising. Exercising is a, is a very common one. And there is um, a really cool uh, article that's talking about at least 17 or 18% of people who go to the fitness will uh, have an injury. Uh, that year. There's also some really cool data that shows that uh, about 130 out of 100,000 people will experience some kind of injury as they go to the gym, even if it's a small little sprain or anything like that. Last year, let's see, in 2019, I'm going to look at the injury count for, you can look at the injury count for so many different things. In just exercise, there was 468 thousand people who got injured doing exercise exercise we would say is generally healthy for their body but yet some people get injured um, another funny one pickleball pickleball is going crazy right now so many people are enjoying the practice and putting themselves on the court playing pickleball it's a little bit more accessible than tennis and and anyways pickleball is awesome and this year, they estimate that four to five hundred million dollars this year are going to be spent in injury costs just from pickleball. So if, if your if your mother, if your grandmother, your your uncle said, "Hey, I, I picked up pickleball. I play pickleball every single day," you would generally think this is something that's healthy. Same with running. Same with going to the gym and exercising. Same with fitness. Same with jujitsu. But there is this state of injury. A, a tax of injury, a cost of injury that is associated with all of these things that we claim as healthy, whether it's running, exercise, jujitsu, pickleball, so many different things are actually physically creating some harm to ourselves. So what does that mean for us as movers, as practitioners, as, as people who want to not only do something that is healthy for our body, challenge our mind, um, face maybe competition and really grow in those areas. And we re also really care about the health of our, our physical state. And we don't want to be injured. We don't want to have ACL tears. We don't want to have low back sprains. But these things that we engage in and that we do oftentimes result in that. No runner would say, I want to experience plantar fasciitis or shin splints or hip impingement. No jujitsu practitioner would, would say, I, I purposely want to experience low back pain or tearing my knee or rupturing uh, a labrum or tearing a labrum, um, et cetera, et cetera. No, no person goes into the gym to exercise and asks or wants to have some kind of catastrophic injury happen like underneath a, a heavy back squat or on one of those knee extension machines blowing out your knee. Like there are so many videos that you could see of injuries all across our exercise, hobby, and sport profile. So these things that we deem as healthy based on our current understanding of what health is um, aren't matching up. Please understand this does not mean that I'm saying do not do those things. All that I'm saying is we like to throw out the word, oh, that is a healthy thing to do. So you should go into that environment and no harm will be done to you and it will be okay. But then when harm does come to us, when we do have, like Lex said, the QL gets tight, you're feeling a little bit weird, um, you wanted to do something positive for your mind, for your body, for your heart, for your soul, and then you go in and then you experience this acute injury whether it is an actual injury or just tightness or like oh my shoulder is kind of out of place um, it's a it's disappointing for us and so i want to elevate our conversation and our awareness around these 
accessory hobbies, accessory activities that we can do with our lives, not as pure blanket healthy for you to do, but that there is a cost for these environments and we have to pay that cost and paying that cost I think is best done in the very beginning what I call earning your environment. Um, what does that mean? You pay to go into the movie theater. You don't go into the movie theater, then you get out and you pay. First, before we go into the movies, I have to pay. I have to look at the times. There's a, a prerequisite order of operations before I get to enjoy the thing, the experience that I wanted to. Many activities like going to the gym or doing jujitsu, playing pickleball, don't necessarily have the order of operations or things that we need to do to pay into that environment laid out for us because we are going into those places are on our own volition and it's kind of up to us. So the conversation that I have with people like Lex or with other people who maybe bike ride and feel hip impingements or go to the gym and exercise and feel low back pain or shoulder pain, the conversation is about earning your environment. And earning your environment means that we have to be very crystal clear on what is this environment's input in my body? Is my body strong enough, capable enough, in a state right now that is able to take those inputs? If it is not, how can I, how can I build myself up to be able to handle those things? Um, and if it is, Even if the worst case scenario happens, am I willing to take ownership for that because I love what I'm doing? So those are the two thoughts I really want to take some time right now to dive into. Earning your environment. We're going to take jujitsu for an instance. Earning your environment and and being aware of what the environment is. Number one, let's take the uh, physical, physical state of the environment into play. You're going to be on wrestling match, two inch wrestling match, which are extremely cushioned for you. So it's going to be good for the cushion, but it's also going to give you an opportunity to be a little bit sloppy with your footwork, with your hip placement um, and with other people's foot and hip placement, which means you're not going to be on sturdy ground, which is going to save you. But at the same time, could make you very relaxed. If you go into any jujitsu school now, you will see many people sitting in a half says a position where one knee is up and one leg is down and they will rest in that same position and then they will even engage in a sparring or a rolling event in that same position. It's very common for jiu-jitsu athletes to get caught on one diagonal, just like a fighter. They're throwing punches regular from right to left or maybe they are throwing punches from left to right. But we get caught in these martial arts settings on one angle. And if we're caught on one angle, that's going to take our pelvis, our ribs, our spine, and create some torsion around that. So number one, okay, I'm on a soft environment, and I'm going to be doing kind of the same repetitive movements on one angle of my body over and over again. As I'm doing those same repetitive movements, there's also somebody else that's going to be doing repetitive movements, constantly attacking one side of my arm, constantly attacking the same side of my neck, constantly shooting on one side of my leg. So there's a lot of like opposite engagement. How, the question is then, how do you prepare for that? Number one, you have to get your body in a state that is so resilient and bolstered that those negative inputs, those twists in your body, those changes that happen with your shoulder and with your feet don't manifest in your normal everyday movement and lifestyle. You will often see jujitsu people with one foot out, one foot regular, and that's their fighting stance or one shoulder higher, one shoulder lower because that one shoulder is the one that they're constantly protecting their neck with. So we don't want our hobbies and our activities to become permeated and permanently involved in our normal everyday postures and lifestyles. So that means that not only do we have to be willing to take those one-sided attacks and one-sided defenses, but then after the fact, be in a, a place and in a mind state, give ourselves the time to decompress the entire system. 
if we don't decompress the entire system, then we're going to have that twist. When you go home and you lay on the couch, you're going to be twisted again. When you go in the bed, you're going to be twisted. Then you're going to wake up and be like, man, one side of my body is feeling something. And you might say, I don't know why. So we need to earn our environments. Jiu-Jitsu by no means is a safe environment for your physical body. It is a fantastic thing to do. The common saying that I am hearing nowadays is jiu-jitsu saved my life but broke my body and it's it's pretty true across the board jiu-jitsu is extremely difficult on your joints on your bones on your ligaments and um, it's not common for someone past 50 who's a lifelong practitioner to be in a state of health where they don't have some kind of acute or chronic injury to their lifestyle there was never a time when I was doing mixed martial arts or jujitsu that I was consciously telling myself, this is physically good for my body. Of course, there are positive benefits. There are positive benefits to my muscles, to my tissues, to my mobility, to my flexibility. But in general and overall, the damage that I'm taking to my physical body is at a net loss. I am paying with my physical body to put myself in those environments. Paying with my physical body does not mean that I'm signing myself up for injury or to feel what Lex is doing. It simply means that I have to take ownership uh, and examine this environment. What are the inputs that are going to take? Is my body in a place and state right now that I am willing and can pay to um, have a little bit of compressive forces damaging and twisting happening? Or am I very fragile right now? And if I go into that environment, something will break. A spasm will happen. Or it's going to put me in, in the ground. Going into those environments which people generally coin as healthy and positive and good is fine. But walking into those environments knowing that my body is going to receive some kind of impact, some kind of compression, some kind of force that I'm going to have to deal with. And really checking in with myself and saying, am I in a, a state right now? that I am physically ready to take that damage. You can take this um, type of mindset and apply it to money. We all know about money and having enough money and having no money. It's like going into a very fancy restaurant. There's gonna be a high cost to pay for that great experience, for that delicious food. Before you go into that restaurant, you always check in with yourself and say, is my bank account, my wallet, in a state that is ready and okay to take this loss of my financial gains so that I can experience this? If you've got a bunch of money and it's no problem, then you walk in there and you're happy as a clown and you're happy to pay a tip, you're happy to pay for the cost. Um, but if you didn't check your bank account and you were on a date and you paid for the meal and then the bill came in after the fact and you didn't have money, well, whose fault is that? It's not the, the restaurant's fault. It's not the food's fault or the management's fault. The fault is always on us. We walked ourselves into that environment. That environment had a cost on us. And if we weren't aware of that cost, then it's because we didn't examine the environment properly enough. We didn't examine our, our money, our own internal world, and we didn't examine the outer world and look up maybe beforehand how much the meal was going to cost before you actually went and ordered something. And I'm sure all of us have been in that situation where we went from a place of unknowing to knowing where we uh, went to a restaurant, we bought some food, and then the bill came in and we were like, wow, I, I was just very willy-nilly and I was just buying things. And if I would have known that it was going to cost that much, I probably wouldn't have gone in or maybe I would have waited until I had enough money. Same thing with jujitsu, same thing with sports, same thing with going to the gym. Um, knowing when you are in a state that is healthy and robust and you have a positive net outcome to where you can take the cost of whatever environment you're putting in, whether it's pickleball, the wrestling or jujitsu mats, whether it's the fitness world, all of these places have a cost. They're, none of them, absolutely none of them are going to give you just purely a net positive benefit. So it's very important to understand that. And um, now just breaking it down into three parts. 
So earning our environment. What does earning our environment look like if we actually practically look at it? It's looking at like three places. Number one, how do I prepare myself to engage in the cost of the environment that I want to put myself in? This looks like your actual warm-up and your actual prep of your physical body and its tissues before that environment. That looks like staying hydrated. That looks like getting some good sleep the night before. That looks like making sure that your nutrition is on point so that you have enough calories and energy to perform. Um, not drinking, not putting your state yourself in a state that is like fragile. Um, all of those things beforehand. And then during, knowing your limitations and also knowing you know, the ins and outs of the environment. I'm going to give two examples. The first example is a little bit more general so people can understand. And that's going to be in... Uh, though the gym or fitness setting if you're in a gym or fitness setting let's say you go with some friends and you want to work out with your friends and your friends are very competitive and they like lifting heavy weights or going really fast or or challenging themselves or like you're in a crossfit environment knowing your own limitations and being like should i work out with joey and peter and joey and peter are lifting much heavier than i am And when they lift heavier than I am, they're going to encourage me to push past my boundaries. And I'm also going to feel this ego inside of me saying that I should also be lifting where Joey and Peter are. So I'm going to put some weight on the bar and put myself in a dangerous position. We don't want to do that. We want to be very aware of what the capabilities are of of our body and what we're trying to get out of that environment. So there's a very specific input that you need. And when you go past your capacity and you have too much of an input, some very bad things can happen. So check the ego and make sure that who you're around are also supporting the specific input that you need that is good for you in that day. In the jujitsu environment, there are specific people that I will say, thank you, no thank you, I will not roll with you, I'm not going to grapple with you, I'm not going to slap hands and tangle with you for five to seven minutes because either I've done it before or I just watched you and you were very erratic, you're very uh, aggressive, and you were trying to rip people's heads off. I saw you wrist locking this person, I saw you uh, like trying to yank on this other person's neck, it was super sloppy. Um, submission and I'm looking for clean partners who know what they're doing who know when they have me in a submission or know when not to and also if I start tangling with you I know myself that I'm going to start to turn it up to 11 I'm going to get start to get angry I'm going to start to put a bunch of force on and I can put myself in a dangerous position because of that interaction so thank you no thank you I'm going to find a training partner who's going to be better for me today So in the environment that you're in, checking yourself and knowing what your capacities are and um, with the intensity, the duration, all of these things. If you're a runner and you're running with people who are running at a six minute mile pace and you generally run a 730 or an eight, is it a good idea for you to go on a three or four mile run with them? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they're going to be running way past your capacity. You're going to push yourself and then you're going to have some shin shin splints or some hip impingement, whatever. The third place that goes with earning our environments, the third place is about what happens when we leave or when we exit that environment. In wrestling, jujitsu, mixed martial arts, it's really common for people to spar to go into a violent interaction with another human being who's yanking on their necks and yanking their shoulders, slap hands after that and be like, man, that was a really good tussle. Jump right in their car, drive right home, get in the shower, and then plop themselves on the couch. And so they were twisted up in the gym and then they go home and they're resting in this position that's kind of twisted up. The same thing with people who go and weightlift. They'll go and weightlift and do this crazy stuff all their muscles are full of blood and they're like open or maybe they're closed from weightlifting because they've been doing so much concentric work and then they go right home, they sit on the chair, they sit on the couch and they're further closing themselves off, closing, closing, closing. Runners too, after running, just doing a a huge run and boom, going right into work setting or going right into um, having lunch with somebody. It is extremely important that we know how to turn ourselves up and on 
for to be present for the environments that we want to be in. And it's also extremely important that we know how to turn down or turn off, decompress ourselves. Because whatever cost we pay to get into those environments, whatever compressive forces, whether it's weights, whether it's like compressive forces on your shoulder from doing pickleball or on your hips from running or on your low back from jujitsu, if we don't have a good plan in place to decompress, to let our nervous system, our body, our minds, muscles relax back to a state of health, back to a state of spaciousness then the more that we continually go back into those environments the more compressed we will be in the weightlifting world and in the jujitsu world you see this the more that i weight lift the more that my shoulders and my neck go into this hunch forward position and it's hard for me to move around i put on so much weight so much compression so much tension that i no longer can like be an athlete or even like raise my hands in the air, the classic bodybuilder who can't wipe his butt. Same thing with jujitsu. You see somebody who's just kind of shriveled up in the front space because this is where I play jujitsu and they don't give themselves that ability to decompress and regain a normal state for their life. So the way that they're weightlifting or doing jujitsu or running becomes their everyday posture and everyday movement. And this is very taxing on the body. So before the preparation, the during, and the after is how we really take ownership and really earn the environment, earning the environment of jujitsu, earning the environment of going to the gym, earning the environment of the pickleball court. If you are somebody who's in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, and you're sitting all day, and then you get out of your car to go play pickleball for one to two hours, and then you go right back to the couch, it's like you're asking for something bad to happen. Um, so we have to be really aware of the activities and the hobbies that we love doing, that feed us, that give us so much good stuff. And the more that we can take the environment, examine the before, during, and after our inner and outer environments, the more that we can engage in those environments repeatedly without becoming like having such a negative cost to us. I would not go to the restaurant that was a five-star white cloth, you know, cost me $1,000 per meal if my my monthly income was three or $4,000. I wouldn't go to that place every single day because I couldn't afford to do it. So what can your body afford to do? What is the actual state of your muscles, of your tissue? It, can it go and handle jujitsu? Can it handle drilling? Can it handle sparring with somebody? Can you handle putting 400 pounds on your back? How do you know if you are capable of doing that? And doing the thing is not a good compass for us. Because you put 400 pounds on your back and you squatted it, and I said I squatted it, and now I'm not injured, therefore I am able and capable enough to do it. And it's not, it's not like that. Just like the analogy with going to dinner. Is this something that I can repeatedly do in my lifestyle? Does my lifestyle allow for this to happen? Or does it only allow for me to do this once every month or twice every month, two times a week? We have to get very uh, aware of the cost benefit analysis for what something is going to be doing. And if we just let our egos get ahead of us and because of hobbies, pickleball, running, uh, jujitsu can be readily available. We can just go in those environments day in and out with a general la, 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 this is a healthy thing for me to do and my body's capable enough to do this. And then boom, when something happens, we're like, what? No, now I feel betrayed. The thing that I love to do is now hurting me. The thing that I love to do is not accessible to me anymore. And now I don't even know who I am and what's going on. I'm going to lose muscle mass. I'm not going to have time to train. This can be um, very hard on us. But it's because we did not examine the environment and it's because we did not examine our inner environment. So please, before you engage in all these hobbies, take a moment to earn the environment before, during, and after. And be very crystal clear with yourself about that. And if you need help, this is where a movement coach, this is where going to somebody who is in that sphere who is also healthy you can start to ask them questions about how they train or how they would, how you would suggest I progress myself in this environment. 
Um, it's very important to look at the people who are ahead of you, who are doing it and doing it well. Please avoid asking the person who has been doing this for 5, 10, 15 years who is completely broken. You don't want to follow that person's footsteps. Or maybe you do. You want to just um, you know, really go hard, burn out bright, and then you're okay with whatever's happening. But if you find somebody who, let's say, is a 60-year-old pickleballer or a 70-year-old pickleballer and they play three or four times a week, and they feel fine, they don't have any ankle sprains, they don't have any back problems, they don't have any wrist or elbow problems, examine that person and, and examine the state of their body, what they do beforehand, what they do during, how, what's, the, what's their nervous system state when they're playing, are they super aggressive or are they relaxed and chill, do they play back to back or do they bring water, are they had, all of these things are, are very important for us to understand as we go into these worlds that are completely accessory, football basketball, jiu-jitsu, weightlifting, fitness, pickleball, tennis. All of these things are unnatural movements. Our body is not necessarily designed to do these things day in and day out. Our body is also not designed to eat fast food and McDonald's and drink beer. But you can, as a human, make the choice to engage and participate with those things. All of those sports or any of those fast foods but it's very important to notice that okay if I go out and I hang out with my friends and I drink some beers I know that it's gonna take a tax to my general well-being and health quality of life and so maybe I'm gonna drink some more extra water or tomorrow I'm gonna be very clean with my diet you know how do I integrate this into my body instead of just saying oh it's just beer you know it's just it's no big deal it's just a little bit of this a little bit of that and I can just have it at zero cost to myself this is not the place that we want to be in where we are engaging in activities we are eating things or we are doing things and we're saying oh this is just healthy to my body it's 100% purely positive we're not aware that there is a negative to it there is a cost to just about everything so Lex, dude, I feel for you. Um, the common QL thing is a problem, but now that this has happened um, with the QL and we're a little bit aware of the environment, we can start to ask ourselves some questions um, about all of these different things. The last topic that is extremely important is taking ownership of the environments that we put ourselves in. I'm gonna go back to the restaurant analogy. If I walk into the restaurant, I take a date with me, I think it's a nice place, and then I order, maybe it's one of those restaurants that doesn't even have the price on the menu, and then I get the bill back, it's $1,000, $2,000, whatever it is, it's a lot of money, and I don't have the money to pay for that. If I stand up and I start yelling like, hey, like I didn't expect this, I didn't want this, like what? And I start embarrassing my date and she's like, what the, like who's this guy? Like how did he not know? Um, I could take this and turn myself into a victim mentality and say, um, this is now happening to me and I don't want this. I can't afford this. I can't pay for this. You didn't tell me how much this was going to be. Blah, 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 blah. We want to take ownership for the environments that we put ourselves in, the hobbies and the things that we that we engage with our physical body um, to the worst case scenario. Let's say we go into a, a jujitsu environment. Before I go into a jujitsu environment, I have a conversation with my body. Maybe in the earlier that week or maybe beginning when I'm getting back into a jujitsu training cycle. And the conversation, it goes like this talking to my body like I'm talking to it like it's my friend and I say I love jujitsu I love training I love the community I love what it does for my mind I love what it does for for like an emotional aggression release I love how my body feels I love the challenge of it I love the competition but I know it's taxing on you I know that it doesn't feel good for you to get Americana a million times and to get put in a guillotine choke I can feel that in my neck I can feel it in my shoulder I'm going to do my best and I'm going to earn that environment beforehand. I'm going to warm up. I'm going to take care of my diet. I'm going to take care of my sleep. And in that environment, I'm also going to be aware of not putting myself in crazy positions that are going to further damage you. And afterwards, I'm going to give you some time to decompress and return back to homeostasis. 
a nice neurological state of calm. And if for whatever reason, this is the important part, I'm in that environment and somebody yanks on my knee and my ACL tears or slams me on my neck and I break my cervical spine or chokes me unconscious. If any of those situations happen, I promise that I will take 100% ownership for what happens to us and I will be there to pick up the pieces afterwards and to rehab us and to do whatever is necessary to get us back to a baseline of health, strength, happiness, whatever. That is extremely important, a very important conversation to have with your body because when you go in those environments and that thing does happen, it's not like, oh my God, this is happening to me. It's like, no, no, no. I put myself in this environment. I knew this was a possibility. And so now what? Now what I'm going what am I going to do now that I have this back spasm? Now what am I gonna do now that I have this torn labrum? Am I just gonna say, like, man, this is so I feel so sorry for myself. I'm just gonna sit on my couch and be like, man, I'm so disappointed. This is happening. I thought I was strong. I thought my shoulders were good. I was doing all my exercises and now I'm like in this like bad place. Or am I gonna say, yep, I already made that agreement with my body. So now I have to do the work. Now I have to get back to rehabbing, to understanding more about my shoulder, more about my QL that I didn't know before. And the next time I go in that environment, now I have a little bit more awareness on how to navigate those places and end up in a good positive state afterwards where I'm not debilitated. Taking ownership of the environment. Many of us do not want to take ownership of the environment Because if we actually ask ourselves about, hey, are we ready and willing to take the most egregious injury that comes from this? Is this worth it to you? For some people, it's and for most people, it's not. Are you willing to go into the gym to squat 450 pounds and to have the possibility of breaking your back or tearing your ACL? If you ask somebody that like sincerely, most people would say, no, I don't need to do that. So if they said no to that, then you shouldn't see that person with 450 pounds on their back because that's not a good place for them. And they didn't want to do that. They didn't make that agreement with their body. They're not willing to take ownership of that. If somebody says 100%, squatting 450 pounds, 500 pounds means so much to, to me that I'm willing to take the injury to my body. And when that happens, I'm willing to pay whatever, I'm willing to rehab whatever, I'm willing to do whatever it it takes, whatever it costs for me to have the experience of squatting 400 or 500 pounds. It's like, great, do it. I hope you do it. I really hope you do it. I hope it's enjoyable and I hope nothing bad happens to you. Nobody wants anything bad to happen to them. So to to kind of complete this and, and round this all out, in a whole uh, setting, in a whole nice circle. All of these hobbies that we love to do, we can't just blanket them anymore and say, these are healthy for me to do. Like that, that, that doesn't work for us. And it's not helpful to us in the intricacies of our body because so many people are getting hurt. So many people are getting injured. And number one, they don't know why. And number two, they get injured and they rehab and they just go back into the same environment and continue to engage in the same behaviors that got them injured in the first place. And when they, there's like really two options that to me is like the worst. The first option is this is a healthy thing for you to do. Go back into it and make no change to your behavior. No, make no change to it, how you earn the environment whether it's preparation, whether it's how you navigate that that environment as you're doing the act or after the fact as you decompress and heal your body. That one, just the, the cycle, the psychotic cycle of going in, hurting myself, going in, hurting myself. Oh, this is the third time that I've blown my back out on deadlifting. It's like, come on, let's 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 wake up a little bit. The other way that is also equally as egregious to me is when you go then you have no idea why you don't take ownership 
oh, I did this deadlift and now I broke my back or my back is spasmed. You go to the doctor and he says, hey, you've got bulging discs. You can no longer weightlift. You've got bulging discs. You can no longer do jujitsu. You've got hip impingement. You can no longer run. And they just kind of close that door for you. And you say, well, I don't really know. I don't take ownership for my body. I relinquish the right for somebody else, for a doctor to take ownership of my body. And my doctor told me, these are the environments that I can play in, and these are the environments that I cannot play in. Both of those situations are no good. So as we are looking at our lives and the things that we love to do, hobbies, sports, activities, whatever it is, we want to take ownership of what it is that we're bringing into our life, the effect that it has on us, especially physically. And second, if that is something that you really love to do, do your due diligence to prep, to get your body in a state that is able to take the cost, to navigate those waters in a way that is making a positive change on your body and isn't driven by ego to hurt yourself. And in third, make sure that after the fact, you have a good place and plan to really calm your body down, heal your body, and decompress if needed. This is the whole general conversation on earning your environment and taking ownership of the places that you're in. And I have this conversation pretty frequently with clients, um, with other coaches, because there's a huge blind spot of unawareness or ignorance that they're like, well, I just go into the gym and I back squat and I deadlift and I do all these things that, and those are things that make me stronger, that make me healthy, that make me better. And I'm like, hold on. Like, we can't just say this is like 100% good for you. Obviously, there's something happening when we, we co go into those environments and there's a negative cost to it. There is 100% a compressive negative cost to your body. But it's really easy for everybody online in the social media world or even doctors to say, ah, strength training is great for you. Doing martial arts is really good for your character. Or doing uh, running is a really good way to increase your cardio and, and people should run more and it's good for you without really understanding what it means to put yourself in the arena of the gym, of a weightlifting arena, what it means to really put yourself in the arena of running for miles for distance or for going and starting a practice of jujitsu. We're waking up to this. More people are having this holistic conversation around this, and I hope this conversation has somewhat got you a little bit more aware or thinking, asking yourself some different questions on what are the places and what are the things that I love to do with my body and how can I earn those environments better so that I can continue to show up in those environments so I can thrive, so I can have a positive experience and I can do that um, for as long as I'd like to. That's about it. Um, and to close this off, I'm going to say this whole entire spiel was brought to you by soul sense these are soul sense these are delicious smelling essential oils and they're really for males like this one is aegis and this one is xanthos made with coconut oil sandalwood um, and geranium okay these are some very pure essential oils that make you smell really good natural and they don't have all those xenoestrogens in them guys if you're putting perfume on and deodorant on to your body and taking those chemicals in what are you doing you got to earn the environments if you're going out on a date you're going out to the club don't go out there with some things that are going into your body that are creating more estrogen um, and instead do something that's really nice for yourself and put some nice scents on so that you can continue to smell good without taking the cost of putting some chemicals in your body and around your body and messing up your hormones Anyways, this is Coach Bam um, with Primal Movement. Thank you so much for checking this out. Earning your environments and taking ownership of everything that happens in those so that you can continue to move, be free, live long, and happy. <laughs>